Well, good afternoon. Welcome to Deep in Scripture. This is Marcus Rodi, your host for this program, coming to you from the studios in Ohio at our Coming Home Network home branch, if you will. And I have as my partner today on this program, Ken Hensley, co-worker, uh, good friend, um, Chief Poobah of our Western office out in California. Hello, Ken. Hello there. I jokingly Doing say here. offices because we don't. We have an office up in Perrysburg, an office here in Ohio. But we, we don't have offices all around the world, but our staff has been distributed as we've grown, not just in our our staff, but to use the technology that our good Lord has given us to be able to work together in a way that we wouldn't have been able to 45 years, 50 years ago. Uh, yeah, when you called me the chief poobah of the uh, Western <laughs> office, I started looking around to see if there's anybody else working here, but no, <laughs> it's just me. But it's it's uh, great for you all to join us on this program and for Ken to you also to join me on this program. Um, this particular episode of Deep in Scripture uh, if you will, is going to be uh, an entryway or a kickoff to uh, a long series of programs that I'm hoping, Lord willing, that Ken and I will be able to do together <clears throat> as we move into 2020. Ken and I, <clears throat> excuse me, thought what we'd love to do is rather than every week take different scriptures as we've been doing, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, what we'd like to do is to take some time to focus on uh, New Testament books in their entirety over a period of weeks, <clears throat> and actually to to focus in a more seriously exegetical way with those books. And I guess I would say also in a more seriously apologetic way. In other words, <clears throat> as we look at and, and we're thinking about starting with the book of James for a number of reasons. We'll do that in, in, in starting in a week or two. But is to look at that book in such a way that how did we look at James before when both Ken and I were Protestant ministers? And then how have we come to see it through different eyes? I mean, is that... Does that kind of describe it, Ken, as you think about yeah. what we're planning to do as we go forward? Yeah, I'm excited, too. It'll be good. Yeah, James is one of those books that, um, you know, I was brought up Lutheran, and good old Luther was not <clears throat> a big fan of James. Um, and I suppose if I went back into my file cabinet of sermons, I have a, a file cabinet of 10 years' worth of sermon notes, I'm not sure that there'd be many sermons on James— I, I'm pretty sure I taught through at least once, but it's one of those. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking, Marcus, you don't want to overstate it, though. Uh, Luther only said that he wished he could take James and throw him in the stove and burn him up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because he said he was flatly in contradiction to St. Paul, but but we'll get to that. Well, that deals with the yeah. issue of when when you've publicly stated your convictions— and then in the process, you encounter facts that make you question your convictions. Mm -hmm. The question is, are you able to say, oops, I was wrong? Or do you look for ways to work around the facts to always come back to make yourself look good? And I'm not necessarily saying that's what Luther did. But when he expressed his convictions about justification by faith alone, mm -hmm. in, in the strength of that, almost redefining the gospel in a way that was never clearly said that way in, in the previous 1,500 years, and then James looks right in his face, well, what's he going to do? Yeah, and you know what? I would, I would defend him in this sense that— this is what we all do for a time. Yes. That is that that is if we think that we've got a theological system that is kind of coherent and worked out, you know, then we're in what we used to call the hermeneutical circle, meaning yeah. everything needs to substantiate that system or that worldview we have. And if someone throws facts at us that don't fit, the initial reaction is, 
how do I make this fit? This has got to fit some way. How do I work it out? It's only when a certain number of facts come at us that challenge the hermeneutical circle that we can begin to crack, you know? And so this is something that basically everyone does for a time. And I did as well. And I did too. For a time. Well, and eventually it leads to what I called the mandate to become Catholic, if you will. Because as you were saying, the hermeneutic circle that I was caught in was a bit different than yours, even though we were both Calvinists. Mm-hmm. But there's no, there are many, many groups of Calvinists today that see it differently. So whenever you study Scripture, you bring to it your hermeneutic circle, your 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 presumption, your the lenses through which you look at mm-hmm. it. So mm-hmm. all this to say that what Ken and I are going to do, hopefully maybe next week or the week after, we're going to start, and we're going to start digging through the book of James Uh, each week, Um, and we hope that you will follow that. We'd love to hear your comments, questions. You can propose all of those on the community, right, Ken? Uh, Yeah, yeah, it'll it'll be set up to do that. And uh, I'm not setting it up. I have no idea how to set it up, but it'll be doing that. It'll be John, Mark, Seth, or or Matt, or it'll be set up Mm -hmm. so that we want you to be a part of this. We encourage you. The, the most important thing you could do, if you're listening, you don't want to be a part of this, the most important thing you can do is in one sitting, read the book of James from cover to cover. It won't take more than 15 minutes, but read the book of James from cover to cover, the whole way through. And in Greek. It, well, <laughs> we, won't, we won't extend that challenge to you unless you're uh, equipped to do that. But we will be looking at the exegetical aspects of that and uh, and how we understand that book of, uh, of James for our lives today. But as an introduction to that, and just what you were leading to, this idea of a hermeneutic, what <clears throat> I thought I'd invite Ken to do today is we're going to follow the older format. I'm bringing a, a scripture onto the table. Ken's going to bring a scripture. We're going to talk about it, then we're going to put them together. But I extended the idea to Ken of <clears throat> the theme of sola scriptura. In other words, if we're going to study a book of the Bible, uh, and as Ken alluded to, this idea of our hermeneutic lens, our hermeneutic <clears throat> uh, platform through which we interpret a scripture, and finding that we had a conviction for a long period of time that was shattered. One of those for both Ken and I was the idea of sola scriptura. And so with that as an overarching theme, I thought I'd ask Ken and I, let's come to the table with a couple of the scriptures that we used to use as foundation stones to our defense of sola scriptura. When Ken, you or I got in front of our congregation, <coughs> if that issue ever came up and we had to defend to our people mm-hmm. why we believed in Sola Scriptura, what would be the the weapons that we would use? And, and I don't know, Ken, if looking back before we jump to the scriptures, did you ever have to do that back when you were a Protestant minister? Were you ever found yourself having to convince, defend the idea that it is Scripture alone. Actually, in, th- in the in the circles in which I operated, in the church I was in, the answer is no, really. And that's why my approach is going to be a little bit different um, than yours, but that's good. We'll be putting together some different ideas, because in my world, this was the atmosphere we, we breathed. Now, I saw it supported in Scripture in many different ways, but I wasn't challenged to defend it. But we'll come to that. I want yeah. you to, and launch I'll just out. say as an introduction to that, I, um, my entire first forty years of my life was in the Protestant world. There was no Catholic voice at all. It never crossed my mind to think of anything through the eyes of a Catholic, and so mm-hmm. from that standpoint, sola scriptura was the ocean in which I swam and didn't even realize it. It just was there. The only time it came up, though, besides at seminary, in which we had time, in which we looked at the 
reasons that we as Protestants believe this, and I remember that mm-hmm. in seminary. Um, the only other time it really came up is when I led new members classes in my churches, and we would have four times a year new members classes, anywhere from 10 to 30 or 40 people mm-hmm. joining the church. And the, I'll tell you that I don't ever remember in all the years that I was in pastoral ministry ever converting anybody to my church from nothing. They all came from other churches. Mm -hmm. So they're coming to my conservative Presbyterian church from Methodists, Baptists, Episcopalians, Church of Christ, liberal Presbyterian churches, and Catholics. 30% Mm -hmm. of my churches were all about Catholics. So invariably they would say, okay, why do we believe in Pres- why do we believe in baptism this way mm-hmm. as Presbyterians mm-hmm. versus what they used to as a Methodist? And sometimes the issue would come up about the Bible alone because somebody would say they were Catholic. Well, why do you believe in the Bible alone? And so then we'd have to defend it. Or somebody say, my uncle Fred is a Catholic and he doesn't understand why we do this. So what do I tell him? So that's where this would come up. Mm-hmm. And so the idea was, okay, let's bring to the table the scriptures that we used back then. And I'm thinking, Ken, that the scripture I'm going to bring is probably one of the key verses that you used, and <clears throat> it is the key verse that I used for Sola Scriptura, because it never crossed my mind. Never crossed my mind that it didn't teach this. Mm-hmm. It's from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. I really could expand that more, and maybe in our discussion, Ken, we'll look at the wider picture. But 16 through 17, and here's what it says. And I'm reading the Revised Standard Version. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, excuse me, reproof for correction and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So I, without batting an eye, then used that verse to say, therefore it teaches that this book that I hold in my hand Mm -hmm. is inspired by God and it is profitable. In fact, I do know either the King James Version or another one uses the word sufficient. It's sufficient Mm -hmm. for teaching everything I need to know to be the kind of person God wants me to be. And that's what I would say. That's what this says. Mm -hmm. This book, all Scripture, is inspired by God and profitable, sufficient for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. Now, that's what I believed for the first 40 years of my life. I was taught at seminary. That's what I was taught as a young Lutheran when I went through catechesis. That's when I, later when I was a congregationalist pastor and then a Presbyterian pastor, that's what I taught. It never crossed my mind to challenge it, even when I looked at the Greek. The word scripture is the word, I I wish I brought my Greek with me, Ken. It's the word graphe which means writings. That's what it means, all writings. Mm -hmm. And the word inspired by God is not four words in the Greek. It's one word that most clearly is translated Mm God-breathed. So so really it comes into that phrase, all Scripture is God-breathed. All the writings are God-breathed. That's what it's saying. And I just assumed that when it said all the writings are God-breathed, it's this book. Now, my mind changed drastically on that, and here's how it happened. First, it involved getting back in touch with our mutual friend, Ken, uh, Scott Hahn, uh, my classmate from seminary. I had heard he'd become Catholic. I thought it was a bad rumor or a lie. I couldn't even imagine that. I thought he was had slipped into the Catholic Church to convert Catholics out of the Catholic Church. So we got back in touch, 
and I heard his story about why he became Catholic. And in that story, he talks about being uh, uh, a side attack by somebody on what is the pillar and bulwark of truth. And Scott's answer is, my answer would have been, is that the pillar and bulwark of truth Mm -hmm. is the Bible. It says it right here. That's the point. All Scripture is God-breathed and equipped and able to equip you for everything. So that, therefore, it's a pillar and bulwark of truth. It never crossed—when when I first heard that from Scott, yeah, it's the Bible. And the person challenging Scott said, well, well but what's the Bible say is a pillar and bulwark? And I remember Scott saying, well, <laughs> but you, you know, what do you mean, what's the Bible say? And it's, for a second, he couldn't remember the phrase pillar and bulwark, yeah. and I couldn't either. And in Scott's story, the guy says, well, look at— First Timothy three, and that's what's funny is that the the scriptures for the foundation supposed of soul scripture are Second Timothy three, and the ones that undercut this whole thing is from First Timothy three, and the verses from First Timothy three are, and I'm pulling it just so I make sure I quote it right, three fourteen fifteen is uh, that the pillar and bulwark. It teaches how to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. truth. So it's not the Bible that's a pillar and bulwark of the truth. The Bible says that the church (laughs) is a pillar and bulwark. When I heard that, it it was an immediately undercut to everything. It didn't make me Catholic, not for a second. It made me wonder, well, what church? How do you determine what church? I mean, there's a bazillion churches. What church? That began a series of things for me Mm -hmm. and eventually brought me back to this verse. And it made me look at, okay, wait, if the Bible isn't the pillar and bulwark of truth and the church is, it made me re-examine everything. And it made me look at this verse and what I'd been teaching for many, many years, like you and I talked before in the early part of the program, Mm -hmm. that my opinions and my teachings were out there. I had stood in front of congregations telling them this, and when I looked at it, I saw a number of problems. And let me share a few first, Ken, because I know you're chafing at the bit to jump in here. I can tell by (laughs) looking at you, because the same thing I'm sure happened to you. But let me just share a few, and I won't I won't grab all the, the, the great facts, but a few of them. Here's the one couple things that jump out here. It says, just to look at what it says, all Scripture is inspired by God. Number one, all Scripture does not, number one, necessarily mean that that equates with this book I'm holding in my hand. Because it doesn't define a canon. It doesn't define which books are in this book. It doesn't Mm -hmm. define even all the Old Testament books which are in this book. What also crossed my mind is that when Paul wrote this scripture, he had no idea that what he was writing by quill on a piece of paper was going to be a part of a thing called the New Testament. And so when he was writing this down, he couldn't have been Mm -hmm. referring to the New Testament. He could have only been referring to the Old Testament. And the reason we also know that is that two verses before, Paul turns to Timothy, who he's writing to, and he tells Timothy, as for you, continue in what you have learned Mm -hmm. and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ, mm-hmm. Jesus. Well, when Timothy was a little boy, learning it from his mother, there's, there was no New Testament yet. This letter hadn't mm-hmm. even been written. So what Paul mm-hmm. is referring to could not have been either the New Testament as we know it or this book as we know it, because the canon of Scripture wasn't even finalized until sometime in the fourth century. One last thing I want to put before I open the door to you, Ken, is that in that process, what blew me away was that when you look at the Greek of the New Testament, whenever you 
find a scripture that is a quote from the Old Testament. First look at it in English. Whenever you look at the quote in the New Testament, and then you, you turn over and you find it in the Old Testament to compare it, they're never the same. It's mm-hmm. like, what's wrong here? Paul or Timothy or, or James or John, they're misquoting the Old Testament. There's something wrong here. However, when you look at the Greek and you look at the, the verse in the New Testament that's quoting the Old Testament, when you look at it in the Greek and then you look it up in the Greek Old Testament, in the Septuagint, mm-hmm. they're word for word, which makes you realize that the, the Old Testament that Paul was holding in his hands when he or knew was the Septuagint version. And mm-hmm. the reason that that's a big issue is that the Septuagint had all the Old Testament books not just the truncated version that I had as mm-hmm. a Protestant minister. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, this verse had all kinds of issues that raised okay. questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you, <clears throat> you've thrown a lot of things out there on the table. All right. So um, let me kind of pull them together and then add to it. All right. Mm-hmm. See, the... Um, the idea of sola scriptura, as it's defined in Protestant theological literature and whatnot, is basically contains two ideas. One is what we refer to as the material sufficiency of scripture. It's basically the belief that all of the content, all the, the, the revelatory content that God wants us to have is there in the Bible, either explicitly or implicitly, to be drawn out, yeah. to be drawn out. and. This is something that both Protestants and Catholics can agree on. In fact, John Henry Newman's view was this. Cardinal Ratzinger, um, Pope Benedict XVI's view was this. So material sufficiency. But where Protestantism and where I as a Protestant went beyond that is what we refer to as the belief in formal sufficiency, which which basically means, okay, material sufficiency, everything we need, revelation from God is there. Formal sufficiency means, and it's stated there clearly enough that we can all learn it by reading it, and we don't need anything else. We don't need anything on the outside to interpret it for us. We don't need any authority on earth and whatnot, okay? In fact, I've got a little quotation here from a couple of Protestant theologians who summarized it in this way, Marcus. (laughs) The Bible, nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else is all that is necessary for faith and practice, okay? Now, I bring that as background because what Paul says to Timothy in that passage, he says that all scripture, and you're right, at the time he could only be referring to the Old Testament and the Septuagint Old (laughs) Testament, uh, but the Old Testament that Timothy had been taught, all scripture is God-breathed, it is inspired, and we as Catholics believe this, All scripture is inspired by God. And then the next word that's important is, and it is profitable. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for all these things, so that the man of God may be complete or perfect, thoroughly furnished, sufficient for every good work. Okay, now added then to the problems you raised, the problem that I have with the passage now is that An advocate of sola scriptura is simply, I believe, simply trying to draw more from those words than Paul intended and that can be rationally drawn. And let me give this as an illustration. Okay, my son used to skateboard. He was an avid skateboarder growing up. So imagine I say to my son, and I'll be revealing my age here (laughs) by my illustration. Imagine I say, son, I want you to eat lots of Wonder Bread. (laughs) You have to eat Wonder Bread. Because I, I watched the commercial, it builds strong bodies in seven ways. And listen, you need to eat Wonder Bread because it's profitable for building strong bones, for building good muscles, for calcium, for all the all the wonderful vitamins that they put into this white, fluffy stuff. And I want you to eat lot, lots of it so that you will be complete, thoroughly furnished to skateboard, you know, to run the rails, to do everything. No one listening to me, and I, I'd be using exactly the same structure of language Paul's using here, no one would ever think that I was saying to my son that all he needs is Wonder Bread, you know? 
Right. That, uh, you know, Ken, uh, so are you saying he doesn't need to practice? Are you saying he doesn't need to eat anything else? I mean, no vegetables, no fruit, no milk, no meat, you know, just Wonder Bread. And I say, no, 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 that, that's not what I mean. You know, I'm I'm just saying Wonder Bread is really good and, and therefore it's profitable so that he will be perfect, so that he'll be complete. So in other words, the words don't even really rationally lead to that conclusion. Yeah. And Okay, and although we're going to get to this in depth when we get to James, I have to just mention it quickly, okay? There is a parallel passage in James, which I won't read right now. Is this a spoiler where, alert? Uh, well, uh, well, for one little portion of, a, <laughs> of our James study, but that's fine, because we'll be going back to it and going in depth. Um, there's a passage in James where James says that we need patience. And he says, I want you to be patient so that you may be perfect. And he basically says the same thing that Paul says yep, here, yep. And, and but now he's saying patience. And so I want to say to James, so James, are you saying that all I need to be perfect is patience? I mean, I don't need the Bible, or I don't need prayer, or I, I don't need the work of the Holy Spirit, I don't need the grace of the sacraments. Well, in a similar way, when Paul says the Scripture is inspired by God and profitable in all these different ways so that you as a man of God can be perfect, he doesn't mean to say that that's all that is needed, yeah. that you don't need prayer, that you don't need the Holy Spirit, that you don't need anything else to be perfect. Well, so I think that the whole thing kind of collapses. I remember the more I studied this in that time for me, which took about two years be before, between the time that even the idea that there was a problem arose to the time mm -hmm. when my wife and I entered the church— those two years of studying just so much. Um, in some ways, I became to the uh, embarrassed, almost to the point of being ashamed for how I had emphasized sola scriptura uh, way beyond what Paul could ever have imagined. Um, and I came to believe that the kind of sola scriptura that so many non-Catholic Christians hold to, just like that quote you just gave, doesn't match what Luther intended, that the Reformers could possibly have intended. Mm -hmm. um, Luther, amazingly, was, a, to some extent, a, a full-blooded Catholic to the day he died because he was in that soup all of his life. He was a Catholic mm -hmm. from the time he was. So most of what Luther was doing was always within a Catholic context. He was he was picking at things and he was, but, but there was a lot of his Catholicism that was a part of who he was always, mm -hmm. even his devotion to Mary. But it was the second, third, and fourth generation Lutherans that had never been Catholic that kept pushing it farther and farther until we have Christians today that say, not only do I not need anything but Scripture, I don't need history. I don't even need a dictionary. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I don't need I don't need commentary. I don't need to go to school. I don't need any kind of advanced biblical studies. I don't need to know Greek Latin. All I need is the good King James Bible, because if that was good enough for Jesus, it's got to be good enough for me. And Luther and the reformers never meant that. The absurdity of all of that, you know. Although, although I've got to say that L L Luther did make some statements along the lines of "every Christian is his own pope and council." He did it under the pressure of the church coming at him and saying, "You are wrong, and you need to recant." Under that pressure, he was pushed against the wall, and where he said, "Look, unless I'm convinced from Scripture, that's my basis." And so, he did make some statements that. The second, third, and fourth generation, all they really had to do was kind of wind out the implications of these statements and uh, to come to the full blown. But you are right that Luther is a is a transitional figure. He's he's well, he, uh, he Catholic, never, he's Catholic to the core, but but wanting to reject the authority of the church. Proof of that is that, as far as I know, Luther never questioned the Trinitarian understanding of God. No, he never. So when you think about no. that, if he never ever challenge that idea. That idea isn't sola scriptura. You can't be an unquestionable Trinitarian and be sola scriptura, because 
the idea of the Trinity, one God in three persons, comes from outside the Bible, comes from a council, comes from many, many decades of, of theologians and bishops battling over an understanding of a few scriptures that could be interpreted lots of different ways. Um, in fact, just this morning I was reading uh, in uh, First Thessalonians where he says, um, well, if I can turn to it really quickly here, oh boy, um, Where he, oh boy, we're going to find it. I don't know if I can find it really quickly. The very verse mm-hmm. that says um, about um, you know, God our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Mm-hmm. Well, well, how do you fit that into the Trinity? And and to a certain extent, the early heresies, the Arians, mm-hmm. were more Bible alone than the conservative Orthodox Christians. And yeah, so, and, 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 I, and Luther was to say, it never crossed yeah. Luther's mind to challenge that, which screams the fact that he was never sola scriptura. He always looked through the lens of how he understood traditional mm-hmm. Christianity, well, would, but challenging different aspects of it. Yeah. You know, you know, I will, I, will, I would want to say to that, that, that um, as a Protestant in the past and now as a Catholic, that uh, again, material sufficiency, I think that we would agree that the material is present in scripture yep. to construct the theology of the Trinity, but it is not clear And you're right, there are all kinds of passages that raise problems to it, to where if you were doing Bible alone, you know, you could see someone building a pretty good case for tritheism. You know, there's three gods or a pretty good case for modalism, that it's one God who's just appearing in different modes or some some of the other heretical views. Arianism, you know, when the text says that Jesus grew in grace and knowledge, you know, um, but anyway, we're getting off the topic, except to say that that you're right, that it was it, it was the leading of the Holy Spirit in the church over a period of time that came to what we have now as the Trinity and that we hold to be essential doctrine, essential. You can't, you can't although I, I think it may be many independent evangelical churches, maybe there really is no concern for whether you're a modalist or a, or a tritheist or a Trinitarian or whatever, but but your yep. point's well made. Okay, let me get to my passage then, okay. all right? Okay, all right. Before we, before we uh, burn out of time. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, and here's where I said that, uh, I said earlier on that I approached it a little bit differently because the passage that comes to my mind is the passage, I don't even need to read it, in Matthew chapter four, where the devil comes to Jesus and is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And Jesus famously responds three times by quoting scripture. It is written, it is written, it is written, okay? Yep. A, a clear statement that Jesus is using the text of inspired scripture in his battle with the devil. Inspired scripture is authoritative as far as Jesus is concerned. That's clear. But the reality for me, Marcus, is, uh, you know, as I said, you use the analogy of the, the ocean. It was the ocean in which you swam. And I can say it's the atmosphere that I breathe. Yep. But when I look back on it, at the Bible study where I first met the Lord uh, when I was 22 years old at a home Bible study, the assumption was we open this book, the Bible, and we study it and we learn from it. And this is it. I mean, this is our sole authority. The church that I attended, it was assumed. The Bible college that I went to and got my my undergraduate degree in theology and Bible, it was assumed. It was simply the air we breathe. No one felt they needed to stand up and demonstrate Scripture alone. Um, the same in seminary, although there was deeper discussion of these issues, but at Fuller Theological Seminary, it was still the assumption. Um, it was always simply the case. And I think that the logic which was more implicit than than uh, stated outright, the logic was simply this. This book is inspired by God. It's God-breathed. 
Yeah. Where is something else that's inspired by God? Is there anything else laying around that's inspired by God? And the answer was no. You know, there's no teacher that's inspired by God in the same way. There's no theologian. There's no church. There's no church council. There's no creed. You know, the Augsburg Confession of the Lutherans or the Westminster. There's no creed that is inspired by God. And so is kind of a simple deduction. If this is inspired by God and nothing else is, then, uh, you know, ipso facto, you've got sola scriptura. Now, where it began to unwind for me, so, so you've got Jesus, you know, uh, Matthew 4 was my text, but right. let me explain a little bit where it began to unwind for me, Mar Marcus. And I know that you share a lot of this. First of all, it was my experience as a preacher over time, the, the difficulty of sola scriptura, which was, the fact that it leads to division. And it seems to lead naturally and inescapably to division because I thought of myself as a, a, one of the smart guys and I'm in my pastor's office every week and I'm, and I'm beginning my exegesis with the Greek text of whatever passage I'm working on in the New Testament. And I'm pulling down great scholarship from my walls and I'm consulting all these theologians every week and I'm preaching. I'm, I'm, I'm synthesizing all this material, and then I'm standing at the pulpit, and I'm conveying my conclusions about what the Bible teaches on this or that or the other. And yet, there's this vast number of good men and good women all over the world, Protestants, who are all praying for the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know, they're all studying. They're all getting advanced degrees, and they can't even agree on the doctrine of baptism, what it means, what it does. They can't agree on the doctrine of the Eucharist, what it means, what it does. They can't agree on how the church should be organized. Is it is it a democratic thing where everybody votes? Is it deacon, is it the board, is it the presbyters, what? It can't even, they can't even agree on whether salvation can be lost or not. I mean, something so absolutely basic, you would think, and essential, can salvation in Christ, once yeah. we have it, be lost? Yes or no? Can't even agree on that. So it of began things, with me. The most important thing is salvation, and we can't agree on that. Yes. Yeah, so, so to me, it was this experience, first of all. And of course, if you look at the history of Protestantism, you see that experience writ large. And uh, it's only been 500 years that the Reformation churches, the churches that sprouted from the Reformation, have been practicing sola scriptura. And how many denominations are there? Yeah. How many differences are there theologically? And I remember the idea popping into my mind. Imagine this. If we can have all these divisions in 500 years, imagine if Sola Scriptura really had been the practice of Christianity from the first century. <laughs> I mean, I would, okay, I speculate, but I think there would be millions of denominations by this time. In fact, denominations would have completely just dissolved into a Jesus and me kind of uh, subjectivism. And, and, and so it, that's how it began for me. I have more that I can say, but it looks now like you're chopping at the bit to say, to say something. So I, was trying to, I was trying to find a passage in Leviticus, and I couldn't find it right now, uh, that it talked about if you're, if you're a leader and—, and the people in your group disagree with you. You know, if there's a schism in mm -hmm. your group, what mm -hmm. do you do? And mm -hmm. it talks about going out and stone the people. You know, I can't. It, it's a real a harsh passage. You know, if the people rebel, you stone them. And I remember thinking about that verse. You know, that here Jesus in the passage that you mentioned, he's fighting the devil, so he's he's going back and pulling a couple verses out of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Well. <coughs> um, I can I can go back and pull out a lot of verses in the Old Testament that I could misuse in all kinds of different ways today. So how do yeah, I you know? Could, yeah, you could have stoned John Mark to death by now a couple times. Well, there's a, tons of things back there. You know, yeah. uh, in fact, even in our Lord's day, he was challenged by the rabbis about what constitutes the criteria for divorcing a wife. Mm-hmm. And what they were talking about was Scripture. Yeah, it was what Moses had taught. That was the and point. Jesus, How do you Jesus apply Scripture? And Jesus responds by saying, Moses allowed this 
because of the hardness of your hearts. But this wasn't God's intention. And then he goes back to creation. But 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 yeah, the division. Let me throw in one more passage just Please. quickly, because the passage that really began to bother me was Ephesians chapter four. This is where Paul. Now, you know, I've just talked about how you have Protestant ministers all over the world dis- disagreeing with each other and all these cre- uh, all these denominations and ecclesial movements and independent churches being formed. Well, in Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 11, Paul says, he's speaking of the gifts that Christ has given his church, and Paul says, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, now here, some pastors and teachers for the equipment of the saints, for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the cunning craftiness of men. Now, here's the point, Marcus. Here's the point, boiling this down. Paul says here that the reason Christ gave pastors and teachers to the church was to build the church up in unity so that Christians would no longer be blown all over the place by the wind and waves of doctrine back and forth. Well, what happens when you're a Protestant minister and it begins to dawn on you that because you practice sola scriptura and the right of private interpretation, and all these other Protestants are practicing the same thing, that you, that you pastors have become the very people blowing Christians back and forth with every wind of doctrine and every wave because you disagree with each other. You know, if, uh, or, or turning it around the other way, when Paul says that Christ gave pastors and teachers to the church, to build up the church in unity, it, it dawned on me that this would only work, this could only work, if there is some authoritative teaching yep. to which all these pastors are bound. Be, you know, because if you have pastors scattered all over the world, if they're all bound to the same authoritative doctrine, like the Trinity that you mentioned and other doctrines, if they're all bound to a, to a statement of faith, then when they teach all over the world, they will be building up the believers in unity. But if all these pastors around the world are looking to the Bible alone, and they're deciding for themselves what it's teaching, then the pastors and teachers, they are the ones stirring up the wind, stirring up the waves, and blowing the Christians all over the place. And that's why you had Methodists coming to your church for the mem- membership class. And and that's why sheep stealing was the big deal. You know, it's like, oh, this is great. I've got some people from a Presbyterian church coming to my Baptist church or from a Lutheran church or from a Catholic church. They had the, a- pastors, the pastors are the ones in the Protestant world stirring up the wind and waves. Although I must quickly say so that someone listening doesn't go crazy. Catholic priests can stir up winds and waves oh, yeah, too, yeah, yeah, yeah. but they do it by departing from the authoritative teaching, and yeah. and in a sense acting like Protestants, giving giving their own point of view. Go ahead. Now you really are chomping. No, I, I just yeah. There's so much I know. I've I've repeated myself many times over the years, both on the journey home and on deep <coughs> scripture. So I got to be careful not just saying what I've said before because this is such an important issue. Uh, even last week on the Deep in Scripture program when I was with Monsignor Steenson, I used the example of of uh, the circumcision party <coughs> in Acts chapter 11, um, who were upset because Peter, of all persons, said you no longer had to be circumcised to be a Christian. You just mm-hmm. need to be baptized. And the circumcision party, who were the Bible, if you will, the Bible tradition party, were upset. And it points out the fact that you need all three. That Bible alone, the whole idea of Bible alone, truncates a Christian off from both tradition as well as the authoritative Mm -hmm. leadership that you were just talking about. You need all three. Mm -hmm. Scripture and tradition alone aren't enough. Mm -hmm. Because you can look through history and see that if you have just tri- tradition and script, uh, yeah, scripture and tradition alone can be dead letters. They need an interpreter. Mm. 
And so that's why we need the authoritative church that our Lord promised he would give the Spirit to, to guide them into all truth. That's mm-hmm. why we believe. That's why we believe that this book and these books in this book that make up Holy Scriptures inspired by God is this canon because we trusted that the Holy Spirit was guiding those bishops who were gathered, since it didn't just drop out of the sky in King James Version. And the very issue that, that you just raised uh, with, with Peter bringing the gospel to the Gentiles and then the, then the um, a certain party of Jewish believers complaining about that in Acts chapter 11, the, the very pattern that you see, uh, we can see in the solution of Acts chapter 15. In, in, in other words, during the time when the apostles were alive and teaching, we find there that scripture is, is deemed authoritative the oral teaching of the apostles is deemed authoritative. And when there is a dispute, in fact, yeah. when the very first deeply theological dispute occurred, the leadership of the church meets in Acts chapter 15, and they decide, and they send out a decree. So yeah. you have scripture, you have tradition as it were, that is the oral teaching of the apostles, and you have the magisterium right there in the New Testament. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, and I suppose if we put, brought our two verses together, you know, they both emphasize both when we look at our Lord recognizing the authority of Scripture to fight the devil, that affirms its authority and mm-hmm. affirms its source, which is God. Of course, we see the authority of our Lord interpreting Scripture, as mm-hmm. you know, we talked about how He mm-hmm. was the one that helped the rabbis understand the correct interpretation of Deuteronomy. Mm-hmm. We see that in that. So that mm-hmm. what that really that verse, as well as the Second Timothy, emphasizes the fact that yes, indeed, Scripture, as defined by the magisterium and interpreted by the magisterium, indeed is sufficient mm-hmm. for us to understand how to live our mm-hmm. lives. That's the point. All three, and because uh, I don't want anyone to give ever get the interpretation that we don't believe that the Bible is inspired. We, 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 we stand with St. Jerome, if you, you know, mm-hmm. you need to know Scripture if, if you want to know Christ. So we, that's why we have this program. It's about being deep in Scripture. Well, Ken, I'll tell you what, let's pull this to a close, and I'll just remind the audience that probably next week or the week after, we're going to begin our study of James, all right? And so we encourage our audience to get your Bibles out, read James all the way through. It's only about four pages in our Bible, five pages, maybe a couple times. Come with your questions, and uh, please join us for our study of the book of James. All right, Ken? That's any fine. Fi- any final thoughts, my friend? Oh, well, yeah, I've I got a couple things I've got to put out here. Okay. And I'll, but I'll make it quick. Okay. You know, I have that ability to talk fast, right? That's right. Um, Again, quickly summarizing, we can see in the New Testament that Holy Scripture is inspired by God and it is viewed as authoritative. There's no doubt, and Catholicism teaches this. Ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ, right? right? But we can also see that the oral teaching of the apostles is deemed authoritative in the New Testament. And the classic passage on that is 2 Thessalonians 2.15, where Paul says, Hold fast to the traditions you've received— whether by word of mouth or in writing, Paul's teaching was authoritative when it was spoken, not simply when it was written down, okay? And then we have that great example of Acts chapter 15, where when there is dispute, how is it going to be settled? And the leadership of the church comes together, they decide the issue, and this just killed me. They send out a letter, and in that letter they say, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, and they give their decision. And, and we don't read that the churches all over Asia Minor at that time responded, well, that's great. You know, we'll study our Bibles and we'll see if we agree with you. <laughs> Instead, it says that they received the letter with joy. The issue had been settled. Okay, so scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. The answer, the reason I wanted to hit something quickly is that immediately a, a, a Protestant response will be, well, yes. Sola Scriptura comes into play after the apostles are dead. Sure, while they're still alive, 
their words are authoritative, their teaching, when they meet in council, it's authoritative. But what we're saying, Ken and Marcus, what we're insisting on is that once the apostles die, then we don't have their oral teaching anymore. We just have what they wrote, and what they wrote becomes our all in all. It's sola scriptura. It becomes our all in all. And that's why I've got to throw out just one more passage, and that is there's one place in the New Testament where one of the apostles actually addresses the question of how his teaching is going to be preserved after he dies, and that's Paul. In 2 Timothy, where Paul writes to Timothy, and this is what he says. First of all, what he doesn't say is, Timothy, I'm about to die. Get all my letters. Make tons of copies right away. <laughs> staple them together. You know, so you know you need to have rooms filled with copies so that you can pass them out to everyone. He doesn't say that. Instead, what he says is so interesting. Paul says, 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14, he says, follow the pattern of sound words, the pattern of sound teaching, which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard the truth that has been entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so, so follow this pattern of sound words that you've heard from me. Guard what I'm entrusting to you by the Holy Spirit. And then he says in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What you have heard from me before many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Yeah. You, you, you put this together, Marcus, and it, it, it's as though when Paul is preparing to leave this earth and the question arises, how will my teaching be preserved? He doesn't even think about Scripture alone. It doesn't even enter his mind. Instead, he believes that his teaching will be preserved if Timothy will guard it by the Spirit and will entrust it to other faithful men, his successors, who will guard it. And so you, you have the beginnings of apostolic succession here, mm -hmm. clearly. And when we go to the early church fathers, this is simply the view that they have. Yeah. They, you know, you can quote so many of them, but they all have this point of view that the teaching of the apostles— the form of sound words, the pattern of sound words, the doctrine of the apostles is preserved within the church by the Holy Spirit through the apostolic succession. Yeah. And, 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 and all of them believe that Scripture is inspired and is trustworthy, and all of them defend their teaching on the Bible and from the Bible. But when they face heretical movements that come in, that are arguing against that, because the, heret the, the heretics were always quoting the Bible too, and quoting it at length. Whenever they deal with that situation, whether it's Origen, Tertullian, Irenaeus, they always end up saying, we need to go to the church, and we need to look to the churches that were founded by the apostles, in which the apostolic succession exists, and we will get our truth from the church. So, well, it's a good segue for me to mention that another thing that we're going to start doing in the next couple of weeks is we're starting a special segment of our podcast called Deep in History, and I'm going to be joined mm -hmm. by Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson. And what we're going to do each week is to study uh, primary sources from the patristic writings. And the first book that we're planning to do is to study Irenaeus's book on Against Heresies, which was mm -hmm. written in about 175 AD, one of the most brilliant of the earliest books of the Church, and one of the reasons we've chosen that is because it emphasizes all three of the things we've been talking about. First of all, when you read and you look in the index of Against Heresies, he quotes nearly every book of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So already by the end of the second century, they're recognizing the authority of the New Testament letters. Number two, he emphasizes the tradition of the apostles, because that's where he quotes, you know, what we have to trust the tradition as it was handed down, the deposit of faith, and he recognizes yeah. the authority of the bishops and being in union with the bishops. So all three are there in Irenaeus' great book, Against Heresies, but you'll find out more about that. Well, excellent, Ken. Thank you for uh, 
for that last thought. And uh, we probably ought to sign off. Ken, thanks a lot. We look forward to joining you again next week and all of you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. And we'll hopefully be with you again soon. Lord willing, God bless. Thank you. Deep in Scripture is a production of the Coming Home Network International. To hear more episodes, view our full archive of written and video conversion stories, participate in our online community forum, and more, visit chnetwork.org. You're also invited to explore free membership in the Coming Home Network and receive support on your own Catholic journey. Again, visit chnetwork.org for more information.